are going to be starting in 2 Samuel 11. So if you want to turn with me there in your Bibles, or if you've got your phone, that's what I'm reading off of. So we're in 2 Samuel 11. I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 17. The Bible says this. It says, In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he laid with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite, and Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark in Israel and Judah dwell in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, Remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next, and David invited him, and he ate in his presence and drank so that he made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him, that he may be struck down and die. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were valiant men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab. And some of the servants of David among the people fell. And Uriah the Hittite died. Let's break this down a little bit. So Israel's at war, and David, the king, has decided to stay back. He's decided not to fight with his people, and he's at home. And he looks out his window and sees a beautiful woman, and he thinks, I want that woman. So he sends word, and he takes that woman, and what happens? She gets pregnant, which is exactly the opposite of what someone who is sinning wants, right? It's evidence that they sinned, because... Bathsheba's husband's gone, so everyone's going to say, well, where'd this baby come from, right? So David, instead of taking responsibility for what he did, sends for Bathsheba's husband, and he tries to get the husband to sleep with his wife so that there's a logical explanation for this baby. But Uriah's too good. Uriah says, I can't go home to my wife when I'm supposed to be out battling with my people. And so... David resorts to sending him to the battlefront and killing him. And for context, this is the same David that defeated Goliath. This is the same David that God appointed as king. The same David that's supposed to be a man after God's own heart. But David instead fell into sin. He stooped to the lowest of the lows. And my question when reading this is, this is one of the most frustrating stories in the Bible for me, is why would a man described as a man after God's own heart stoop so incredibly low? And I think, after reading this and thinking it through, that the issue at heart here is that David was not content with what he had. David had decided that whatever he had was not enough. And let's be clear, David was the king of a nation. He had a palace. And he had all the food in the world he could possibly want. He had wives. David had everything he could possibly want in the worldly sense. 
and yet he was still discontent. And I think that what this shows us is that if the king of a nation who seems to have everything can be discontent, then being content has nothing to do with how much or how little you might have, right? So often we find ourselves wishing for more, more money, more time, more rest, more friends, whatever it is, we wish for more. And my thing is I, I lust for experiences. Like that is what I want. I want to travel. I want to go on adventures. I wanted to have, you know, before I was married, I was like, oh, I want to be married so bad. I, it'll be so much fun. And <laughs> wanting those things in and of itself isn't bad, right? Like there's nothing wrong with wanting to go on adventures. There's nothing wrong with wanting to travel. But what happens is that I do those things and then I have to find something else, right? I have to find something else that I want, something else I don't have. I grew up watching so many movies and s reading so many books where somebody lives in like a tiny little town, they're a nobody, and their life becomes really awesome throughout the course of the story. Like they move to New York or LA and they like find themselves, right? And so I think that movies and pop culture have really placed this idea in our minds that like we gotta go and find ourselves, we gotta go find our life. And I think that you know movies and pop culture have a part in that, but I think that David shows us that if anything is true, it's that humanity's been struggling with being discontent for far longer than movies have been around, right? David had plenty to be thankful for. He could have thanked God for so many things. Like I said, he has everything, right? He even has wives. Why does he want Bathsheba? And I think that the answer to this is that because in order for him to be content, he would have had to look inward. But what does he do? He goes and he looks outside. He's looking for something outside of himself. And he lands on Bathsheba. And not only did David suffer, but he hurt other people as well. I'd like to read Philippians 4, 4 through 13. This is, this is Paul. Paul's writing to the church from prison, and he says this. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I'll say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And if you skip ahead, it says this. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul tells us that he has learned to be content in all situations, and he's not joking. He's not just saying it. This man is ch in chains. He's in prison, and he's saying, rejoice. There are things to be excited about. Paul is living proof that you do not need to have everything. You do not need to be in the perfect situation in order to be content. We have so many things to be thankful for, and Paul is showing the church in this. He's saying there's always something to rejoice in. You can be content always, and I'm living proof of that. But something that's important about this is that Paul's not complacent, right? Paul had every excuse not to keep working, but what's he doing? He's writing to the churches. He's still ministering, even though he's in chains. He's still sending word. He's still saying, keep the work going. He's encouraging. To rejoice in the Lord always and to be content in all situations is not to be complacent. Contentment is not equal to complacency. When we're complacent, we're not moving, right? We're not growing. Nothing's happening. We've given up. Or maybe we're just going through the motions. But that's not what contentment is, because if we know anything about God, if we know anything about any of the stories in the Bible, it's that God is never finished. 
God's always working. He's always shaping and molding and transforming people. It's a wonderful thing to grow and to have goals for change, but what I want you to hear is that having healthy goals is not the same thing as believing that when you reach those goals, then you'll find happiness or contentment, right? Paul showed us that it's wonderful to have goals. That man, oh my goodness, I think he was overwhelming. I think Paul was probably a really overwhelming person because he was traveling, he was writing, he was planting churches, he was encouraging disciples, which is so wonderful. But man, oh man, did he have goals, right? And yet, he's content, always, in all his situations. Regardless of how far along he is on any given goal, he was content. But I think that just because you're growing doesn't mean you have to be discontent with the process either. I think a lot of times we think, Ugh, the process is really exhausting, or maybe you're waiting. You don't know where God's taking you next. You're in this awkward waiting. You know something is about to change, but you're not sure where or what. And waiting takes some discipline, right? I think waiting is work. And that's what makes it different than being complacent, right? When you're waiting, you're actively listening. You're actively seeking. And it takes discipline to remind yourself, okay, I'm in the waiting. I'm in the patient period. We're getting there. So don't give up if you're still working on yourself. If you're not perfect, I'm assuming if you're not perfect, <laughs> that's okay. It's okay to not be perfect. But don't give up. Keep working. Keep waiting. The other problem is that we are very quick to look at our journey and do things like comparing ourselves to others. We think, oh man, I wish I had as cool a car as that person, or oh, I wish I had as much confidence as them, or wow, their hair is so pretty, and I wish my hair would do that thing that theirs does. And we're really, really good at it, right? Like it's, it's second nature. You almost catch yourself doing it, just comparing yourself to other people. But the problem is that if we're comparing ourselves to other people, what are we doing? We're looking outside our window, just like David was, right? We're looking from side to side instead of looking inward and saying, what can I be thankful for? What is good about me? What skills and talents do I have? What is God doing in my life? We're blinded when we're comparing. We can't see the good in our own lives. We can't be content because we're focused on everybody else. So what happens is we have these if statements. If I was like them. If I could only be as confident. If I had that, right? And those if statements, they hold us back. The other statements is the when statements. The uh, I'll be happy when I get that job. I'll be happy when I get a little bit better at this thing that I'm working on. I'll be content when so-and-so stops being frustrating to me. I'm really good at that one. The, uh, well, when I get to do that, or when I've got this much experience and I'm this confident, or when, 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 right? But those when and those if statements take away from where we are now. That's the problem. So instead of comparing ourselves to others or in comparing ourselves to like our future self, that future self who has achieved the goals we want to achieve or who has received the things we want to receive, instead of comparing ourselves to those things, which means we're either looking side to side at others or we're looking ahead, we need to look inward. We need to look at what we have in the now. What can you thank God for? Do you have food? Do you have a family? Do you have a car that gets you to the job that pays your bills? Do you have a church family that loves you? You do. The answer is yes. And even if all of those worldly things go away, even if the car breaks down, even if you have no income all of a sudden, even if you're on the rocks with your family, even if all of those things break down, what we still have is a God who loves us, a God who breaks chains, a God who is constantly working on our behalf, a God who might be saying, you got to wait, but I'm still working. 
We always, always, always have that. And I think that that is what Paul is getting at when he's in chains. He's saying, yeah, I don't have anything, guys. Like, I'm sitting here. I'm in chains. I can't even leave this place. I have exactly what the jailer gives to me, right, which is just about nothing. But I'm still content because I have God, and I know that God is working, and I'm excited because God is doing great things, and I'm going to get to see those things. There are five really important components to being content, and the first of those is satisfaction. Find joy in the little things. Find joy in your morning cup of coffee. That's my favorite. I'm pretty sure like every time I make a, um, a thankful list, somehow my morning cup of coffee gets put on there first. <laughs> it's just the first thing in the morning. It kickstarts your day. It's warm. Really enjoy spending time with your family. Don't think about the other people you're not spending time with. Don't think about how, now introverts don't come for me. I'm not saying alone time is bad. But don't think about how you could be doing something else on your own. Enjoy your family. Love them. Find satisfaction in all the things that you're thankful for. Take a list and write down the things that you're thankful for. The second thing is a lack of envy. We talked about it before. Comparison kills contentment. Looking at other people's possessions or opportunities or relationships, that all blinds us from what we have. And it tears apart our contentment. The third thing is humility. We have to humble ourselves because I think we very often think, oh, I deserve better. Or I just, I th always thought that I would be at a different place than I am now. And we think, oh, God, what are you doing? Like, I, sh I just, I wish I was in a better place. And God, you, you should really get on that. But that's a pride issue. We have to humble ourselves and remember that we don't know best in every situation. The fourth thing is discipline. It takes intentionality to be content. You have to remind yourself when you catch yourself comparing. We're not going to do that. What am I thankful for? When you remind, you got to remind yourself when you're thinking of the when in a way that is unhealthy, wishing you were already there. Remind yourself, I'm here in the here and now, and this is what I think to th be thankful for now. And the last thing is this, an abhorrence or hatred of greed and corruption. Jesus said it would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle. And I wanted to explain that we're not talking about, it's not impossible for a rich man to get into heaven, okay? We're talking about not a little needle, but the needle was a gate that was in Jerusalem. And um, camels had a hard time going through it, and they didn't like it. They had to go through, like, kind of crouch down on their knees, and it was hard to get a camel to go through. Hard, but not impossible. But the point is that it's so hard if you're constantly wishing for more and more and more and more and more to be content, to be able to focus on the things that matter, to be able to focus on the things that God is doing for you. God's calling you to a life that is fulfilled. That is God's promise to us, is that our life will be fulfilled in him. He sets us free. He works on our behalf. He has a purpose for us. So when we may not have all the things that we want in a worldly sense, maybe we don't have the job that we love, maybe we don't have that car that works very well, maybe, maybe you don't have a car at all to get you where you need to go and you're worried about how you're going to get a job. Life is tough, and I'm not trying to take away from that at all. But what we can learn from Paul is that even when life is tough, God is always with us. God is always working on our behalf, and we always have something to rejoice in. So the next time you catch yourself comparing, the next time you catch yourself wishing that you were already in the next stage, remember that God has given us things to be thankful for now. God has given us a life that is fulfilled now. There's always something to be thankful for. Don't allow yourself to fall into sin like David. Don't look side to side. Don't look out the window. Focus on what God is doing in you now. Let's pray. God, I'm so thankful. I'm thankful for your love for us. I'm thankful that you are always with us. You never abandon us. No matter what hardships we're going through, no matter what sins we've committed, God, you love us. and You work on our behalf.
I pray that as we continue in worship and as we continue into the week, that you would help us to stop those if statements, the if I was like that or if I had this. The when statements of, oh, well, I'll be content when I get there. Help us to stop those and to remember that there are things to be thankful for and to enjoy right now, that you are constantly filling us with your goodness. We love you and we praise you. It's in your name we pray.